to Mindvine, a mental health podcast for everyone. Since our first episode in 2016, we have been sharing stories of recovery, engaging with experts, and tackling the stigma associated with mental illness. The Mindvine podcast is produced by Ontario Shores Centre for Mental Health Sciences and is available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Welcome to the Mindvine Podcast. My name is Daryl Mathers and I'm your host for this very special uh, episode. Uh, Very honored to have a special guest with us today, Dr. Stacey Ariwa, uh, who's got a laundry list in terms of her her bio, but I'll keep it uh, simple. Uh, Obviously a a physician, a spoken word poet, uh, in addition to being an advocate for people in in marginalized communities. And uh, first of all, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you here. You're actually um, just a few moments away from uh, presenting the keynote at our annual general meeting, the first one that we're having in person uh, since 2019. There's a lot of excitement uh, Mm -hmm. around around that, just being able to gather uh, safely and uh, celebrate the year that was. And uh, it's a great chance uh, for us to have a conversation with you about, you know, your journey. Um, and there are lots of different elements to your journey, which we'll, we'll touch on, but uh, just your path to becoming a doctor. Can you kind of describe, take us through, you know, uh, kind of that personal journey? Absolutely. So I've, I'm one of those people that always kind of knew what they wanted to do from a very young age. And my mom told me that when I was about three or four years old, I kind of just declared that I wanted to be a doctor. And of course, at that age, I had no real understanding of what that path was and and really what it took to become a physician. But I knew that my uncle was a pediatrician in another country and that he spent all of his time taking care of babies. And I loved babies. And so that was just the connection for me. I just decided I wanted to be a doctor. Um, And I was very fortunate such that throughout elementary school and high school, my love for the sciences and math and biology and and English, it all kind of led to this emerging fascination and love with medicine. And so I was lucky enough to attend McMaster University. I was in the health sciences program, and really that helped to expand and flourish my love for um, the health sciences and ultimately prepare me for a career in medicine. And then I went to the University of Toronto Faculty of Medicine for medical school, uh, where I realized that I was the only black student in my class. And that really spurred a lot of my advocacy work, um, which I'm sure we'll get into shortly, but that's essentially my the short and long of my journey to, to medicine. Well, like, just to touch on uh, on that part, you know, being the only black student in that class, mm-hmm. um, you said it sparked stuff. So what did it, you know, what did it ignite? I mean, I have an idea because you're all over the world talking about, <laughs> uh, talking about the topic of diversity and inclusion and mm-hmm. equity. Um, but I guess, was it like, how much of a shock was it to you? Or was it a shock to you at that point? Like when, when you realize that you're the only yeah. person uh, in, that, in that situation? So it was absolutely a shock to me because when I was in my undergrad, I was also the only black student in my cohort, so in my my year. And so when I was applying to medical school, U of T was at the top of the medical schools I wanted to get into because it's, it has a prestigious reputation, but also it's situated in the epicenter of diversity of our country. And so I was so excited to join their Black Medical Students Association. I was so excited to have individuals in my class with whom I could identify and who could truly you know, understand what it's like to navigate the ivory tower, you can say, as a Black person. Um, and so when I got to medical school and realized on the very first day that I was the only Black student, it was incredibly disheartening. I felt disillusioned in a sense. Um, And I had the opportunity within the first couple of months of medical school to be a public ambassador and educator of the Black Student Application Program that the the school was implementing in order to increase the number of Black medical students um, historically and, and, and moving forward. And so having had that opportunity, I was very I was very, you know, apprehensive at first because I was told that institutions don't like medical students who are going to, you know, rock the boat and challenge the status quo. Um, However, I decided to continue on with that initiative and to take the opportunity to share my experiences of being the only black medical student as well as advise and oversee the implementation of the Black Student Application Program. So when you mentioned that, you know, you're the only black student in your class, 
I wasn't, that wasn't, didn't necessarily shock me, right? But then when you said that you, you gave it context, like, yeah, U of T is in the center of Toronto and there's no more, more diverse place in the country, maybe even the world mm -hmm. than, than Toronto. So how, how can you have a, a class where there's only one black student in a city of Toronto? Like, how does that even happen? So there are, you know, that's that's a big question and it is a multifactorial answer, but I think to dilute it into some of its simplest senses, one of the, you know, reasons why we see that there is less um, black physicians is this idea of social inheritability. So having a mentor to demystify the process of what it takes to get into medicine can be really beneficial and advantageous for someone who is wanting to get into medical school. And so because there are so few black doctors to begin with, there are fewer black mentors who can actually advise and spirit someone along towards a path of, of, of becoming a black doctor. Um, but then there's also this issue of financial capital and being able to have access to money that can say, for example, allow you to pay for an MCAT prep course or to do volunteer missions abroad, which are extremely expensive. And so we find that both of these kinds of capital are deficient within the black community um, due to historically so much systemic racism that really um, leads to these issues. But we also find that the systemic racism that permeates through educational systems, criminal welfare, criminal justice systems, and social welfare systems disproportionately change the trajectory of black youth away from the STEM fields from a very, very early age. Um, and there are also other factors. And of course, you know, being on, on the topic of mental health and psychiatry, there are also other ways in which black youth are heavily pathologized as having psychiatric illness from a younger age. And so once again, that steers them away from pursuing um, higher forms of education that could potentially lead to um, medical school. So in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> in your particular experience, like what were some of the barriers that you, uh, you faced once you were going through uh, medical school? So one of the main things that I, you know, kind of dealt with was the feeling of isolation. Um, certainly, you know, being the only black medical student, whenever I encountered instances of micro and macro aggression, I always found it um, challenging at times to find that solidarity. And oftentimes I would, you know, tell someone, tell a peer, tell a supervisor what was going on. And I was often met with a lot of invalidation, uh, which is, incredibly painful to have to deal with and process, especially if you're going through a painful situation and then you're seeking support and then more pain and harm is layered on top of that. That was a really challenging thing to go through. Um, and then also doing my advocacy at the same time and encountering a lot of uh, hatred online from individuals who saw the work that I was doing in the media, social media, and they were dissenting, but they were quite um, racist in the process of in the process of doing that, and so trying to go through medical school and com currently completing my master's at the same time, and then also having to deal with the microaggressions, the macroaggressions, and being attacked online was a real challenge. So you're going through all that while trying to complete an education <laughs> and start your career. Mm -hmm. um, then you know, two years ago, uh, George Floyd is murdered, mm -hmm. and. I think things, I, I feel like, the, you know, the world changed. And mm -hmm. um, for you, um, you know, having lived in that world and probably being, um, you know, uh, more aware or in tune to it than certainly people like myself, what what changed for you uh, when that all of a sudden became, a, you know, a focal point of the world's attention? Yeah, so, I mean, from from what I've kind of, heard in the social justice circles, especially amongst black activists, is that it feels like the world kind of woke up to what we've been saying for so long and doing for so long that these issues have persisted. And now, especially during the pandemic where individuals were isolated, a lot of people spent a lot more time on social media. It was almost there was this kindling that was present that sparked when everyone saw the video of what happened to George Floyd and people almost woke up in organizations and there was these call to actions and holding everyone accountable. Um, and certainly for myself, I felt that with respect to the public speaking work that I was doing, that there was a lot more interest, a lot more interest from different organizations, both within medicine, but also outside of medicine, just wanting to learn about the importance of diversity and inclusion and what it is that they can do to make sure that their institutions were not unintentionally inflicting harm to their racialized um, employees or racialized individuals, cons constituents. And so um, really being able to have 
that there was more of a platform to be able to share the important work that activists were doing. And so certainly um, that was kind of how my world changed in a sense, but also in, in turn, there was also much more exposure in, in a way. And so the racism that I encountered through doing the work that I was doing ramped up exponentially after the George Floyd movement um, and, and since then, and it continues to this day. And so that's been kind of like the, the counterpoint to all the work that I'm doing. So like one side, you know, is, is more awake to what's going on, yeah. but that percentage that um, is never going to wake up, like you just felt they um, were kind of doubled down, for lack of a better term, in terms of their views or expressing their views, like that's kind yeah. of the experience. Yeah, and I would say that, you know, in the last, say really since 2016, when Donald Trump was elected, that the world, especially, you know, North America has become so highly polarized in our mm -hmm. political views and in our societal views as well. And so I think that when the George Floyd movement was transpiring, that we saw that heightened even more, that the people that got it really got it and the people that really, you know, were kind of viewing things on the other side, that that was quite heightened as well. And I think that that emerging kind of polarity really led to more of the challenges that I was facing with individuals online um, and to this day. Yeah. You know, I think about that time, you know, from organization perspective, I think we looked inward about what we could do, right? And um, maybe, you know, enhance some of the things that we we're doing, look at new ways, uh, really evaluate, like, are we really providing the best environment, you know, for everyone? Are we being inclusive? And I think it's, it, you know, it's a journey that, you know, we're kind of uh, reimagining here at Ontario Shores uh, through some of our work. But I know as like just a regular, you know, person in the community, I think we we're collectively kind of looked at, at ourselves when that whole thing was happening and we were forced to kind of look at the world from a different lens. And I think a question like we all have, and we, and I know I don't have the answer, but like, is what can we do? Like, what do we, how do we make um, our community, well, how do we contribute to making our community, you know, an inclusive, equitable, and diverse place? Like, how, you know, mm -hmm. what can we do just as ordinary citizens? Yeah, so that's a great question. And I like to think about the ways in which people kind of lean into advocacy as, you know, there's a variety of ways. You can do big A advocacy, which is kind of like, you know, what I'm doing, like going around and, you know, doing rallies or keynotes or that kind of thing. But you could also do little a advocacy. And that's really, say, for example, checking in as to whether or not the work that you're doing is performative or genuine. And so the genuine allyship can kind of look like taking stock of the diversity in your life. So are you consuming art, music, film, food that is from a diverse perspective? Are you, um, say, for example, taking accountability and responsibility for educating yourself on anti-racism? Are you waiting around for someone to educate you? Um, and so these are some of the simple things that you can do on a day-to-day -to, -day to be a better ally. And one of the simplest things I actually think you can do is, is to validate someone's lived experience. So if someone's telling you about something that they've been through as a racialized individual or as a marginalized individual, and you know, you are invalidating them, that's one of the most harmful things you can do. But, you know, just sitting with them and their experience, and I think that especially rings true when it, with respect to mental health and how that can marginalize someone, um, just sitting with them and their experience and providing validation to that person can be one of the most powerful things that you can do as an ally. And so that's what I, that's a simple thing I think you can do as a day-to-day -day citizen to really be a more effective advocate. One of the things that is happening too is in this shift, um, and it, I guess it runs uh, parallel to cancel culture to a degree. You've seen companies kind of remove certain images and names that uh, have uh, racial undertones or maybe not even <laughs> undertones, some of them. Uh, and you've seen companies try to be a little bit more uh, maybe aware of the messages they're putting out there and being more inclusive. One of the things was Mattel, um, putting out a, a new version of Barbie in your image um, in collaboration with, with yourself. So one, like I can't imagine any girl actually dreams of uh, <laughs> being a Barbie one day, but what was that experience like? Just you can channel, channel your, uh, your, your, the little girl inside you and what it's like to have uh, you know, a toy yeah. that, that kind of designed after you and like maybe the bigger picture of what you hope that means in terms of influencing another generation. Absolutely, so having a Barbie made in my image is 
honestly one of the coolest things. It was an absolutely surreal experience and getting to work with Mattel and really to ensure that the Barbie was an authentic representation of who I am. And so ensuring that the skin tone was, you know, the appropriate deep hue. And then also with the hair, ensuring that it was Afro textured and that it was full and beautiful and, and, ref and reflective of the natural hair movement that I'm very much a part of. And, you know, ensuring that the Barbie also looked like a doctor, that it was a black female doctor and that that was clear was really, really important. It was also such a great experience to go through. And then you know, being able to have that doll, especially as a little girl growing up who loved playing with Barbies, but never saw a Barbie who looked like me, and especially did not see a black female Barbie, but just didn't see a black Barbie, period, to now, you know, fast forward 20 years later, have a Barbie that's made in my likeness, and that, you know, I can show little black girls out there that, hey, you can also be a physician, that we are existing within medicine and we're thriving and we're doing incredible things here. And so I think that it speaks to the power of representation and the importance of instilling confidence in little girls, little boys, and anyone really who can one day, you know, pick up a Barbie and see themselves in a field and imagine that they can also be there as well. You know, as an advocate for, you know, marginalized communities and as a resident in psychiatry, yeah. you know, if you have those lenses on, and you think about, uh, you know, kids growing up being able to see themselves. And I even think about, like, in my world, like, uh, you know, in a Zoom meeting, being able to put up a hand that's not just white, uh, yeah. right? Being able to pick an icon that actually represents, like, who you are. And, and I think that's just a small example of some of the things that are happening now that are, uh, you know, in the name of inclusivity. Mm -hmm. But that generation that's going to grow up, you know, seeing different... Uh, different colors, if you will, being able to pick a hand that looks like theirs, being able to play with a Barbie or, that, or a toy that um, they can identify with. Mm -hmm. um, how important do you think that's going to be for this next generation? Yeah, I think it's incredibly important because I believe that you cannot be what you cannot see, that it's, it's really, really hard to imagine yourself in a field. And I remember being that little black girl who always wanted to be a doctor, but I didn't see a black female doctor in the flesh until, you know, decades after that, the, the conception of that dream. And so it's really important to be able to be that representation for that individual who feels marginalized to look up to you and say, wow, if that person is doing it, then I can also do it. And it also helps them to understand that it's a safe place for them to be. Because I know that there is a lot of you know, individuals who might have thought, well, I don't want to be a doctor, I, I, I don't want to train at this specific institution because it has a reputation of, you know, not necessarily being the safest place for black students. And so once you build up that critical mass of black individuals within a space, it enables, it enables more individuals to want to come in there and know that, okay, this is a safe space where I'm going to have solidarity and where I'll be able to thrive and reach my full potential. And so representation is really, really important for that reason. The, the work that you're doing now, um, and it seems like a, a lot. Like how, like, like, it, like you have a lot on your on your plate, and I guess um, because you didn't see, I'm guessing, you know, that because you didn't see uh, representation of what you wanted to do when you were growing up, you want to be that for somebody else. So how do you envision yourself being that for somebody else? Like, you know, is it through social media? You know, the work you do there, like. How do you, um, you know, I think you're, you're kind of positioned to be like a, a, you know, a mentor in a lot of different spaces. So how do you envision all that working over the next, you know, few years? Yeah, so I'd like to think that my advocacy shape shifts in a lot of different ways. And so one, and, and most importantly, firstly, and most importantly, is my role as being a doctor. And so every day when I'm going in and having those moments of clinical care, and I encounter a lot of black youth who see me doing the work that I'm doing, then that's one way in which my representation takes form. But then also doing my public speaking. And I do a lot of media work. I do a lot of you know, keynotes and public speaking. And so being able to get up in front of a crowd and 
allow myself to increase that visibility of black female physicians, that's another way that I do it. Um, social media, to be quite honest, I'm not the best at. <laughs> it is something that I am trying to, you know, keep up because of course the, the younger generation are so heavily um, involved in social media. And so I do think it, it is an important platform to be able to reach them. And then lastly, my continued writing. And so I actually have a memoir coming out in the next couple of years in which I will detail my journey to and through medicine and to and through advocacy. And so I hope that that's another channel through which I'll be able to have that visibility and representation. And today is, you mentioned like one of your, one of your first in-person events that you're, you're speaking at um, since kind of restrictions have eased here in Ontario, mm -hmm. but you've been speaking throughout, you've been doing a lot of Zoom and uh, um, other, using other technologies to speak to audiences and obviously before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, what are, as you, you know, you share your story and you have conversations with people and uh, you take questions and you deliver answers, like what are some of the uh, reaction or what experiences do people share with you mm -hmm. after you've shared your, your story? Um, you know, I, I think that I'm so incredibly lucky so far to have had incredible experiences when sharing my stories to an audience that, it's often an overwhelmingly positive reception. Individuals feel really inspired. And I think that's probably the key resounding um, response and feeling is that they just feel really inspired by my story. Um, a lot of people resonate with it. They can, I've seen individuals get quite emotional, especially if they've had their own experiences of feeling discriminated against or marginalized, then certainly if they can connect with it, then that is like quite an emotional and, and, and evocative moment for them. Um, but overwhelmingly, it's just been that they feel inspired. And I think that's what keeps me doing the work that I'm doing, even on the days where I feel really tired or overwhelmed, or if I, you know, get more hate online, like these are the things that I always fall back on are the incredible responses that I've received and the stories that I've heard from individuals who have attended one of my talks. You know, you're you're out there on um, all over the place, like on social media and on obviously certainly on online, and you're in communities uh, talking all the time. You're also when you do that, and you know, and you think about the things that you've already encountered, you are uh, vulnerable, I guess, to you know, to people not sharing your views or not appreciating um, who you are and and what you're all about. If people, you know, want to take on those advocate roles is it important like how do you manage some of that negative stuff that you get like mm -hmm. is it a support network is it uh, like do you have a way of of, uh, of managing it so you maintain your you know your own personal wellness like is that something that you have to think about when you're doing this kind of work where you're going to run into people that aren't going to say nice things that are not going to um you know align with your view is that something a consideration that you have oh absolutely uh, the primary way that I do it really is through therapy. <laughs> and I mean, it's, I'm, I'm in psychiatry and uh, so obviously mental health is a passion of mine and I, I try to live what I preach. And so certainly being able to unpack those experiences with a therapist has been really, really helpful. And of course, setting my own personal boundaries is very important as well. And so um, I do try and limit the amount of social media that I'm on, especially you know, if I am getting a lot of, you know, hurtful messages, I do try and limit that as well, but then also leaning into my support circle. So having my husband and having my family and friends who are an incredible protective bubble in a sense, who really do help me stay afloat throughout all of the things that I'm doing. So even though you're kind of just starting out in terms of um, life, I would say, you still have a long way to go. You mean, um, you, you know, you're very young, starting your career, you've already like immensely, uh, successful and what in 2021 Time Magazine named you one of the next generational leaders which you know it sounds like um, when Times recognizes you it's usually at the end of your <laughs> you know your experience the end of your journey not at the beginning um, you know when that was bestowed upon you like what uh, what did that mean to you? Well it was an incredible honor it's one of the most incredible achievements I think that I've 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 had um, it's it's funny because I was seven months pregnant when I was given that honor and so I remember being on on set for the photo shoot and for the video shoot and being heavily pregnant and feeling so exhausted and often wondering to myself like is there ever going to come a point in time where you know I, I have to step back from doing these things and from you know leaning into these opportunities but it's just 
such an incredible chance to be able to further that representation as well. And I do find that being able to share my narrative enables me to feel empowered and enables me to overcome some of the more difficult experiences which I've, which I've alluded to. And so being able to have had that opportunity and to be a next generation leader just reminds me of the immense responsibility that I have and to use this platform, this voice that I have, to use it appropriately and to never, you know, depreciate the importance of that. And so, yeah, it's been a great opportunity. Yeah, you mentioned, um, you know, being pregnant and you're now a mother of a young son. Yeah. You, you were um, active in advocating, you know, long before he was around, but mm -hmm. being a mother now, does that, um, fuel you a little bit more to make changes like the you know in terms of the world that you're you're going to be introducing him to does that play a factor into um, your motivation oh absolutely absolutely especially it, it really factors into every decision that I make for him um, you know and and every time that I hit a stage every time that I talk to someone every time that I you know go to work and do the work that I'm doing it's that I'm trying to create and build a better world for him but also for every little boy that looks like him, every for, every for every little girl, every person who feels they're marginalized or that their voice and that, they're, that, that their space, you know, doesn't deserve to be occupied, like that is exactly what I find fuels me and enriches me. And so absolutely, I, I really did think that after my son was born, so while I was pregnant, I was thinking like, I don't know how this is going to impact my advocacy, if I'll feel the need to step back because I didn't know what motherhood was going to be like. Um, but it's had the absolute opposite effect. I, you know, love being a mom. I love being able to be at home with my son, but I also feel so much more empowered to get onto the stage and to continue to do this advocacy work. And he, he's just been a catalyst for all of that. In, in terms of the, the world that you're raising him in and what you, the changes you've seen, are you hopeful as he starts to go through the stages of life that things are going to be different for him or encouraged, I guess, maybe a better, uh, better word. Are you encouraged yeah. by what you're seeing? You know, I, I, I am hopeful. I think I have to be hopeful to do this work. It takes a lot of hope and believing that change is possible. And so I, I am absolutely hopeful for the world that he will be growing up in. And that's what also keeps me doing the advocacy work that I'm doing that, you know, if there's, you know, do I believe that we are where we need to be? No, but I do think that we are getting closer to where we need to be. Well, you being here today is helping us get closer to where we need to be as an organization. And um, we're all excited to, to hear your keynote and really appreciate you taking the time to be here today. Thank you. Oh, thank you. It's an absolute honor.